Hey guys, welcome back to Pillbox Movies. I'm Hank, and today we're going to be watching the 2000 Japanese horror film, Seance. This is a film by director Kiyoshi Kurosawa. We've previously covered some of Kurosawa's other works with videos on Pulse and on Cure, and so I figured it'd be good to tackle another, another one of his. Seance is based on the... Uh, 1961 novel Seance on a Wet Afternoon by Mark McShane, which was actually previously adapted into a 1964 film by Brian Forbes. Brian Forbes is a really great British director, and I've actually seen Seance on a Wet, on a wet Afternoon. I'd really recommend it. It's one of my favorite movies, just absolutely eerie, doused in atmosphere with incredible paranoid performances by Kim Stanley and by uh, Richard Attenborough. Anyways, um, Seance on a Wet Afternoon is about a uh, husband and wife medium who conspire to kidnap a child so that she can act like she's found her to boost their credibility and their fame. It's a horrifically dark concept and I'd love to see what Kurosawa does with this material. So yeah. Let's watch let's watch Seance. Seance. And this was produced in um one of the more prolific periods in Kurosawa's output during the kind of surge of the lost decade which is explored in the outer rungs of Cure and Pulse, and perhaps more directly in Tokyo Sonata. I love these conversations that Kurosawa's characters have in his movies about psychology, about hypotheses and science and ideology. The, um, this concept's kind of explored and phenomenon, psychological phenomenon. It's explored in Cure, certainly, but also in um, in um, Creepy as well, in that movie about kind of criminal mentality and the mind of a psychopath. And here we see kind of psychic hypotheses and their connection with psychology being observed. Shadows, silhouettes moving through kind of a gauzy lens. Definitely explored impulse. Oh, that silhouette. And is that seat more decrepit um, on this angle than it was on from the other side? Because that's also an idea explored in, in Cure. The kind of inside mind of a character, their perception of the world differing from reality. No, someone else. Ah, I love these like scenes happening in like broad daylight. It's such a, it's so creepy. But having light be so strong through the windows, the exterior world, and just uh, by contrast, it creates this bit of drabness, this bit of darkness in the interior scenes. Could have been something else. Don't try and communicate with the dead unless you are prepared to handle something coming, responding back.
pretty standard one. Oh hey, it's um <laughs> the '90s greatest Japanese actor. Oh, what's his name? Uh, Koji Yakusho. Uh, big '90s breakout uh, actor who previously featured in Cure, of course. And the interaction between um, technology and the supernatural offering new passageways, new gateways, is something that's brought up in Pulse as well. Perhaps a fun little kind of meta theatrical moment, kind of like blow out the sound engineer or the, um, oh, what's the term? The, um, the Foley artist is, uh, manufacturing sounds in perhaps the same way that in, in the same way that this movie will be manufacturing sounds to create a desired effect and the image of his equipment the uh, suitcases that keeps everything in of course will probably double as a as like a um a coffin <laughs> I don't know what it is that distinguishes Kurosawa from another filmmaker, like a similar filmmaker of the, a similar time. Like, I'm thinking about this versus, like, uh, I don't know, like Ring, Ringu or, like, um, nor ye of this time but the length of time he keeps on a shot on a character you just get so much to um in terms of observing textures just noticing the 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 the, the like the the lattice work on the curtains noticing the kind of ruffles on her sweater the the specific fabric on her sweater He really gives you a tactile sense of the location. <laughs> this is a shot he's going to mirror in uh, Tokyo Sonata as well, from the uh, reverse angle, but the wife, when she's left alone in the house in Tokyo Sonata, she lays down on the couch in what may be described as a kind of like a fit or a... Uh, kind of mental episode. You can even see just like the finish on the table. What are the directors would you notice that for? Smallest, slightest sounds just exaggerated. Such small details brought to the forefront. And like Ackerman, um, we're seeing the same setup, the same uh, dining room or uh, shared space where she was holding the seance with the client, but we're seeing it from a different angle because the relationship that's being displayed is different. Do not answer that question. The distinguishing green dress is a really nice kind of accent or detail. No. 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 Yeah, dude suck. Dude suck dick. Jesus Christ. And the uh, mentally unwell wife. This is obviously something that was written in the original work, but this is a kind of character type that um, Kurosawa has visited before. 
it's something that's expressed in Cure with uh, the main character with the detective's wife. She has some sort of mental impairment or suffers from depression or hysteria. But there's also an aspect to it as well in, um, in Tokyo Sonata. Ooh. This is some straight Ringu shit. This is more conventional kind of horror than I'm used to seeing in Kurosawa's stuff. No legs. I'm a, a little bit like uh, half and half on Kurosawa's like visual effects stuff. Because like it's creepy. It conveys like a certain kind of mood, but it's also kind of restricted to its time and can sometimes, just sometimes, skirt the line. <laughs> this is actually making me remember another horrible, horrible uh, horror movie that deals in kind of sound production and is a uh, oh, fucking white noise. It was uh, Michael Keaton's like first attempt at a, like a career resurgence back in like I don't know, like 2009? 2008? What was white noise? 2005, wow. Ooh, that's a brilliant little detail. Okay, so maybe they didn't conspire to kidnap this girl. Maybe, um, I, I guess Koji picks up footage uh, or, or picks up audio of her in the in in the woods, and so they have a clue that they can use to um, to help discover her. But they try and couch it in the um, in the wife's uh, psychic work. Or it goes even further than that. Uh, I guess perhaps they accidentally have her body. Hopefully she's still alive. Let's just keep say she's still alive. I really want her to still be alive. The use of green. The use of green to evoke the the presence of the child, I guess. Maybe she's an actual psychic in this version. I, if that's the case, it'd be very different from, say, on, on a wet afternoon. Although, I guess to a certain degree, maybe, perhaps. The wife's psychic abilities is left ambiguous. This is why you always gotta check your equipment. heard a good sound. Something that he hasn't heard. Something that's confusing him. So Sasaki, his... Oh, one of his uh, workmates, the guy who did the kidnapping. You better sense that fucking girl. Plenty can be said of Kurosawa's use of darkness to convey dread. But it's also, I think, 
um, aided by his use of repetitive motions. The kind of ways he slowly constructs expectations in the part of the audience, and with that expectation, is uh, with that expectation it is the build of dread, is the building of dread. Again, the green association with the with the girl. Because she wasn't certain. Yeah, I like the green. It's off in the distance. You've got to find an interesting sound, man. You got to open up your equipment. too late. Oh god. Oh god. It's too late. Oh god. What terrible circumstances. Oh god. It's so much worse. These two are so nice. I can't really feel like the, the script bend them to whatever outcome they're going to have here. They're so normal. There's nothing that really would tip me to believe that they would try and massage this circumstance to their advantage or even away from their guilt <gasps> what the hell okay she's safe that's great this is a good thing that's not a ghost she's okay These are circumstances where I'm like, uh, I, I like can't bend my will towards um, whatever shit they've got going on. Because I'm just worried about this child's welfare. If they were evil or conniving or desperate, then whatever. We could concentrate that on them as the as the protagonists and whatever psycho shit they think of. But because they're so normal. I'm just like, you're normal people. Take this child to the hospital. I'm just like, literally get this girl to a hospital. Come on. Koji, you're too normal of a guy to be doing this. The only way I would accept this is... If this is a ghost, and they think it's a normal live girl, but it's a ghost haunting them. She's seen both of your faces. What are you talking about? あ、
私これで終わっちゃうのいや、see these are not great circumstances I, I, I just question what would put them in the mental headspace to do this like for me there's like not exactly a fundamental tension in this because their actions are at such a disconnect with the character that's been presented to us at the beginning of this especially since it's Koji enacting a lot of this when we're meant to question Junko's uh, mental state I know he's doing it for Junko's benefit but her uh, aspiration, her desire for this doesn't seem to match the severity of what they're doing How did this even happen? Divine fate, I guess. He meant like you'd win a lottery ticket or something. This is far beyond the reaches of what I was... I don't know. I, I feel like it's messing up the order a little bit too much. There's a... Not everything has to conform to a certain kind of... Scre uh, construction or narrative construction or whatever, but... Seance on a wet afternoon is so kind of prescriptive, almost to the degree of being formulaic, but you enjoy that formula. You enjoy seeing the steady escalation and the at, at every step you're like, this could be an avoided. You had to make one choice and you didn't make it. And um but I understand it from your perspective. With this, there are kind of um twists and turns that occur seemingly at random that I don't think are justifiable within the parameters of these characters kind of behavior uh, like the girl accidentally crawling into Koji's um, sound equipment suitcase the uh, girl accidentally dying um, Junko telling her um, police associate where, that she knew where Junko was and that or the, that she knew where the child was but then said to give her more time uh, that seems suspicious as hell. I guess this is that going towards a different ending, though, where they're going to be haunted by this child. The use of, of the close-up camera is interesting. Not something I usually expect from Kurosawa. It's very kind of... Um, it feels of its time. It feels very kind of evoking the um what's this era called in japanese horror cinema like the j-horror conventions this feels more like um ringu or one miss call or the grudge or juon than any other kurosawa movie that i can think of nice use of the sunset lighting though Is this this sounds impulse too, right? I like that. If they don't show a ghost here, I, I I'd be fine with this. This is a nice little advancement of an idea that this is like a, a mental issue now that it's not like a supernatural issue so much as it is like mountain guilt you can show a ghost at the end but for this scene at least let's just make it a a, a mental episode
ってね分かったのあなたの言う通りどうしようもないって。So this is going to be the retribution ending, which is perhaps the least satisfying ending, but, um, or the, let's say it's the Ringu ending, where they try and make amends, uh, they'll try and, um, fulfill their duty in order to assuage their guilt, and their guilt will be assuaged, and they, they will recover, and then the ghosts will enact retribution, regardless, which is fine. If this actually becomes a story of the wife's despair, that'd also be that that'd be much, 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 much cooler. If this becomes about kind of inherited trauma, the trauma she experiences of watching and participating in the death of this girl, um, she absorbs it. That kind of um, psychic debt, and that causes her to despair and eventually to kill herself and. Then Koji ends up inheriting that despair from her, seeing these kind of psychic actions as a, like a progressive act, as like a disease. That would be cool, but the supernatural shit is not as interesting to me. Let's go. Yeah, on the way. I, I guess what I'm looking for is more pulse than retribution, and uh, this is like the same year as pulse. So I, I guess he takes ideas that I'm looking for and explores it more elegantly. In that, it's reasonable. It's reasonable to to want uh, for him to want to make a different movie from pulse, but I think pulse is a better movie than Seance, given what I've seen so far. Come on, don't do the fucking, the hanger thing. That's such a, I don't know. That's like Mike Myers shit. It's like 30 years old. I mean, if I have to make my peace with what this movie is in this final act, I guess I'm happy to see their progressive, like, accumulating uh, frenzy and despair. <sighs> But it does, it's it's like closer to Retribution than it is to Pulse. And it's closer to Ringu than it is to Kurosawa. Is that a doll? Hey, they got Andy Lau to come in to do an exorcist gig. Flew him all the way over from Hong Kong. I don't know how to explain it, but Creepy and Tokyo Sonata, which don't have any um, supernatural elements to them, they still have, like, progressions in the plot that happen, like, almost at a whim or, like, in a kind of surreal way. Like, you're hearing a fairy tale. Like, you're hearing a story that's, like, being told by a monster. And there are kind of, like... The psychic expressions of the characters, like mental states that feel different from this. This feels very literal and very conceptual simultaneously. <laughs> Jigoku. Aruto Mebarimasi. Naito Mebarimasen. 
And it gets progressively verdant. Maybe he's gonna go back to the forest and kill himself. I, I guess they have to go back to the forest to uncover the body. That would be so Ringo-ish, though. That's nice. She's gonna open up a, a suitcase and she's gonna be inside. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I wish at the end of this there had been... Uh, we'll talk about it later. This is literally Box. I love Box. Box is genuinely one of my favorite movies of all time. This is Box. But weaker. Yo, run, girl. Do a little sprint towards him. Why not? Just to be weird about it. I don't know if you could literally make a kid like your horror movie um, antagonist. Just because they're like a kid. It's like a kid actress. It's just like a little kid. With like dirt and stuff on it. On her. They're gonna conduct one last seance. Hmm? <laughs> In the police headquarters. She's going to admit to their crimes, I guess. That's wrong. They've already discovered the body. They're they're here to arrest them. I wonder what evidence they found. <laughs> this is embarrassing. I'm embarrassing. I didn't know Kurosawa was making a cringe movie. Eh? Okay, he gets it. もういいよ。よくないわよ。早坂さん、これどういうことなんですか。佐藤さん、僕の前で初めて芝居しましたね。その手の中に持ってるもの。It's not here. Sure. In a way, it's the Larjan ending. Oh. If we had ended it with nothing, with just the empty frame, with everybody walking out, that would have been awesome. Um, so, like, um, hmm, um, yeah, so, I don't even remember what I was going to compare this to. Uh, well, Box, I guess. So, let's compare this to Box. 
Box is one of my favorite movies. It's very lyrical. It's very quiet. It's very forlorn. Uh, it's incredibly, incredibly sad. Um, it follows a similar structure to this, where the ghost that haunts the protagonist doesn't actually interact with the protagonist or harm them in the same way that the girl doesn't in this. Uh, the girl is a kind of a, like a manifestation of their guilt. Um, but... So, so the ending isn't like, um, it doesn't, doesn't turn out to be a Ringu. It doesn't turn out to be a retribution. There is no, um, literal psychic entity or supernatural entity in this, in terms of like a physical entity that will enact retribution on you. Um, and so, um, there's no punishment that is going to be enacted on the characters. They have to kind of enact it upon themselves. And that's where I kind of run into the issue with this, where if the third act is going to be passive like that, I, I want to kind of see a transformation happen in the characters, uh, a revelation of character or a change in character. And that kind of happens, but it happens in like the way that you'd exactly expect and not exactly in a compelling way either. Um, it's just the beating of that telltale heart. Whereas with box there's like i don't know there's a certain kind of lyrical quality to it and i don't want to give away the ending to it uh because it's a fascinating watch but it kind of opens itself on it opens on onto itself over and over again to the degree where like you realize that the guilt that the character experiences is a guilt that occurs on a spectrum it's not about a um like a singular event in the way that this is like a a single point of crisis in a character's life it ends up being all these different kinds of guilt that she feels and that is being expressed in um the kind of hell that she is living in and we kind of understand we understand the character's guilt as not like localized, but as an aspect of her personality. And we understand that she, guilt is like a primary manifestation of her personality and a, a way that she kind of reacts to and under, and interacts with the world. And what the reasons for that are, are like multifaceted and perhaps can't even be fully comprehended or understood because she isn't able to um, fully reveal them to the audience. And so with this, it's just so prosaic that the singular point of guilt is, it's so local, it's so simple, and they don't really have a changing relationship to it. Um, Yar. Yeah. I, I do like that the ghost doesn't end up interacting with them at the end. I think that's more Kurosawa than it is J-horror. Um, I think there is an element of the meditative in the third act of this. I just think that it's a, a, like a, just such a wide departure from Seance on a wet afternoon um, that I, I would have preferred the original screenplay and the original script, I guess. Um, there's there's an element to this where uh, I I don't remember if it's present in the original script, but there's there's a thing here that's going on in terms of the couple dynamics of this of Junko and Koji that it's a kind of screenplay that lends itself to a um, gift of the Magi sort of ending. You want to um or like the Crucible for example, you want both mem both halves of the couple to end up making a sacrifice for the other and not realizing that they're doing it. Um, it happens in this to a certain degree, but just so slightly, not necessarily at the pitch that I would want it to. Uh, Junko makes the sacrifice of faking the seance to protect her husband, and Koji makes the sacrifice of revealing the plot um, in order to like take on the some of the guilt or take on the responsibility in the place of Junko. And I think that's like, 
that's mechanically fulfilling the perp the the function or fulfilling the kind of um dynamic that's initiated in this film but it's not doing it in a satisfying enough way um yeah the only thing i can really think from watching this movie is that i really need to rewatch seance on wet afternoon so you know what let's do that seance on a wet afternoon is going to be up next in the meanwhile don't forget to click the like button and subscribe for more old, obscure, and art house films. And until next time, keep watching spooky movies. <laughs>